well, we're uh, going to finish up the creed as part of our um, homily series on liturgy that we're going. And um, so last time we had basically gotten through the entire section about the Son, Jesus Christ, uh, which is all the stuff that comes from the Council of uh, Nicaea. Now, today, we're going to continue to look at the translational changes in the section that is primarily about the Holy Spirit, uh, which was put there mainly by the Council of Constantinople. So first, I think it's important to point out how deeply rooted in Scripture what we profess about the Holy Spirit is. We say that the Holy Spirit is the Lord. That's from 2 Corinthians 3.7. We call Him the giver of life, 2 Corinthians 3.6. We say that it is he who proceeds from the Father, from John 15, 26, and that it is he who has spoken through the prophets, from 2 Peter 1, 21. So very deeply rooted in the scriptures. Also, um, we say, uh, in the New Translation now, that he, it is he who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. And we've changed the, in the new translation, the word gets changed from worship to adore. There's no real difference there. But of course, the meaning of that phrase is kind of like the key of this entire section, that he is adored. He is professed to be co-equal to the Father and the Son, truly God, truly worthy of our adoration and worship. And that is what the, the Council of Constantinople was all about. The final thing that should catch our attention in this part of the, the creed about the Holy Spirit directly is the phrase, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That little clause at the end, and the Son, uh, which in Latin is filioque, is called the filioque clause, and it's, uh, it's very famous or infamous, depending on how you want to think of it, because it is not in the original Greek of the creed. Uh, it was later, added later on by the, the Latin, the Western Church as part of a reminder to everyone that the Son is really God, because if the Holy Spirit is proceeding not only from the Father but also from the Son, then it shows that the Son is equal to the Father. So that's how that got there. And the, the Latin Church, the Roman Catholic Church, professes that this is how things are. And yes, in a sense, the Father is the origin of both of the other two persons, not in a temporal sense, of course, but that the other two persons proceed from Him. But at the same time, we also believe that the Holy Spirit does not only proceed from the Father, but also through and from the Son as that bond of love which exists between the Father and the Son. But this is a big theological divide between us and the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox churches don't agree with this idea of adding anything to the original text of the creed. Uh, and so some of them think it's actually uh, incorrect. But it really, uh, from, from our perspective, this is what we believe, and we think it agrees very well with Scripture. Um, going back to John 15, 26, which I already cited, it, it says, the Lord says to his apostles at the Last Supper, but when the Counselor comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. So clearly the reference is there of how the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But notice that how our Lord says, whom I shall send to you from the Father. So that it seems very clear there that the Holy Spirit is proceeding as well from the Son, and that is our faith. Now, then in the next kind of section of the creed, you might think that we've kind of moved on to a different thing, because we say a fourth time, I believe, when we get to this part all about the church and, and so forth. Um, and But really, we're still in a, in a real sense under this, this section of the Holy Spirit, because the church and all of her characteristics, one holy, catholic, and apostolic, you know, each one of those would be an entire homily, um, but the church the one baptism that we profess, the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. These are all effects of the Holy Spirit in, in the world. And so we're still really in this section about the Holy Spirit. Now, in English, because of the way our language works, we have to say here, I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
But in the Latin, there is no in there. And that doesn't seem real significant in English. But the point is that we don't believe in the church in the same way as we believe in God, the triune God. Yeah, we believe the church, we believe her teachings, we put her, our, our trust in her, but only because she has been given to us by God himself, that she is sustained uh, by the, the working of the Holy Spirit. To God alone do we truly pledge our faith, do we put our faith in him. And so that's why in the Latin we say that we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but we simply believe the church. Kind of a, an interesting meditation point. Okay, so to get back to translational things, um, then the phrase, we acknowledge one baptism, has now been retranslated to, I confess one baptism. And the point to make here is simply that this has nothing to do with the sacrament of confession. This is confess in the sense of profess, you know, as like when you talk about confessional churches or the holy confessors who, uh, you know, suffer for the faith but were not actually killed or martyred for the faith. So it, it shows basically that this is more than simply an intellectual acknowledgement that there is one baptism, but that we cling, cling to this truth of the faith with our, our will, our heart. Then the final point that I, I want to make translationally here is what was look, uh, we look for the resurrection of the dead is now I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Which, I mean, obviously is a little bit more accurate since the resurrection of the dead is in the future. But I think, more than anything, it's kind of a happy coincidence of the English language there because it sounds much more confident and positive, you know, in the sense of, I look forward to this. I, I think it's a good thing. We should all be looking forward to the resurrection of the dead. It reminds us that our hope is not in this life, but in the next. And so, as with uh, so many of the prayers, the creed ends with the great Amen. And we reaffirm, yes, I believe everything that I have said. And so, as I've said before, these words of the creed, they are themselves sacramental. They make present the reality that they signify. And this is why we call the creed the symbol of faith. And so, we want the words uh, of the creed to reflect as perfectly as possible the truth of our faith. So the old translation is good, but the new translation is better, and we should be thankful for that, that it, it can help us in these new words to be more mindful of Jesus, who is present to us as the divine word and as the true essence of our faith.